weather doesn't just happen, it is caused. And as you might guess, if we knew more about what causes weather, we could make better weather forecasts. You might say the sun drives the weather. It hurls vast amounts of energy toward the Earth. When that energy passes into the atmosphere, it causes many of the effects we call weather. One of the major elements of our weather is cloud formations. In this high-speed satellite picture of Earth, you can see the clouds move. Actually, clouds are a little like footprints from which you can tell where somebody's been, where they're going, and if they've been walking or running. Scientists can read cloud pictures in much the same way. These cloud movements are evidence of weather. The picture itself doesn't explain very much about the causes of weather unless you know how to look. By tracking clouds and considering characteristics like their temperature and how high they are, we can begin to explain the rules clouds seem to follow. But clouds aren't all there is to weather. They're just the part we most easily see. Weather scientists break the study of weather or atmospheric science down into three groups. Microphysical scale, the study of tiny water particles and how they form into rain, snow, and hail. Middle-scale weather, the study of individual fronts and pressure cells. Global scale, the study of how the layer of atmosphere around the Earth behaves as a total system. Imagine each of these groups is a layer of building blocks. They all are part of the complex system that we call weather. A change of conditions on one level affects all the others. Weather is so complicated that scientists are singling out, one at a time, individual causes to study before tackling the whole system. As each cause is understood, the knowledge is used to improve the mathematical equations used for prediction and further study of the weather. For the next few minutes, we'll visit NASA laboratories where work is being done on all three scales. One of the major efforts at the microphysical scale is learning what happens in clouds. This cloud physics chamber devised by the Marshall Space Flight Center will go into space on the shuttle. The experiment is designed to help scientists understand how tiny water particles form into rain, snow, and hail. Knowing how raindrops are formed will help our understanding of what causes them to occur. In nature, water evaporates into the air. This water in the air is called water vapor. Cool air above the sea naturally contains a great amount of water vapor. When this moist air reaches land, it is then forced upward because the warm air over the land is rising. Also carried upward are tiny particles called nuclei around which the vapor can collect. The pressure drops as the air rises. As the pressure drops, the air cools. Cooler air can't hold as many water molecules, so they began to condense on nuclei. Continuing upward, the droplets grow. Finally, the droplets become so big and heavy that gravity causes them to fall. But they are caught by updrafts and rise again. By moving up and down with the forces of the updraft and gravity, they finally become large enough to fall to the earth as rain. With all the ups and downs, it has been hard for cloud physicists to study such tiny particles. In fact, scientists in aircraft carrying instruments through a cloud 
usually find it difficult to make small scale measurements. Small clouds can be made in the lab, but as droplets grow, gravity causes them to fall to the bottom of the chamber too fast to study. However, in space, freedom from gravity gives scientists a chance to observe water particles while they grow. This picture compares the behavior of particles on Earth and in space. In this rack is a mock-up of the Atmospheric Cloud Physics Laboratory, which will make repeated trips into space during the 1980s. From experiments conducted in this laboratory, cloud physicists at the Marshall Space Flight Center and elsewhere hope to better understand what happens inside clouds. Now, let's look at middle-scale weather. Well, as you can see, it's a pretty nice day here in the outdoor weather set. But as you look at the national map, you see we have a fast-moving, fairly strong cold front approaching the southeastern states. And we've seen the development of a squall line all along the front. Now, we're seeing the development of heavy thunderstorms, some severe thunderstorm activity reported in this area. And as this approaches the southeast, we're predicting the outbreak of severe thunderstorms throughout the southeast for tomorrow and tomorrow night. Now, let's look at the middle-scale weather. And we'll see that over... Middle-scale refers to weather over an area the size of a state. Scientists working with middle-scale weather usually are interested in the effects of a single weather front. The boundary between two unlike air masses is called a front. Here's an example. You are looking at a typical thunderstorm. The front is created by warm and cold air clashing as they come together at fairly high speeds. The cold air forces the warm air rapidly upward, releasing great amounts of energy. This release of energy is a typical severe storm situation. Knowing exactly what's happening inside the severe storm is very important to weather scientists. Weather scientists of the Marshall Space Flight Center and the National Weather Service are collecting data out of storms as they are happening. These scientists using radar, research aircraft, satellites, and most importantly, weather balloons, create a very accurate and specific map of the temperature, pressure, humidity, and other conditions inside a front. These detailed records show what happens in a cloud as it becomes a tornado, or a hailstorm. This information may help weather forecasters tell which clouds are harmless and which will become severe storms. A good example of global scale weather research is an experiment to learn the effect of the Earth's rotation on wind flow patterns. This is not easy to do. Why? Let's start with the fact that air is cold at the north and south poles and hot at the equator. And that warm air rises and cool air falls. A circulation is created. If the earth didn't turn, we'd have a constant cold wind from the north. But the earth does turn, causing these circulating air currents to mix. Mountain ranges and the temperature differences between land and sea make the circulation pattern more complex. Before trying to take these complexities into account, researchers want to test mathematical equations which state the effect of rotation alone. To do this, scientists use models. In this model of the Earth, oil is used for the atmosphere and gravity is simulated by passing an electrical current through the oil. This experiment will not work on Earth because the Earth's gravity overpowers the simulated gravity created in the chamber. So, the test chamber will be installed in a laboratory and placed in space. There, scientists can use the apparatus to improve our knowledge of the effect of the Earth's rotation in weather formation. 
Let's not forget the sun. All the weather movements we've been talking about get their energy from the sun. Certain wavelengths of energy are reflected back from Earth in the form of heat. Another form which may affect weather is large quantities of charged particles streaming off the sun into space. What happens to these invisible particles when they reach Earth is one of the most interesting issues in science today. Deep in the core of the Earth are hot, liquefied metals which circulate and produce electrical currents. These, in turn, create a magnetic field which surrounds the Earth. We use this magnetic field to tell directions with a compass. The charged particles from the sun, called solar wind, are deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. This magnetic envelope is called the magnetosphere. Although it shields us from most of the sun's particles, some may enter our atmosphere, particularly at the poles, causing the spectacular northern lights. Sunspots increase the amount of solar wind coming from the sun. The activity of these sunspots varies on an 11-year cycle, which appears to correspond to the wet and dry growing cycle we can trace through the size of tree rings. We therefore are asking, does this sun cycle affect the weather on Earth? To find out, Experiments like this will be flown aboard the shuttle. Rain, like all weather, doesn't just happen. It results from the interplay of natural events following established laws. With our increasing knowledge of these laws, more accurate and longer range forecasts are possible resulting in more benefits and fewer problems from the weather.